Hey there, black sheep. Welcome back to the channel. In this week's episode of This Bites, a series in which we analyze the watchtower and highlight how it implements the bite model. If you're unfamiliar with the bite model, it's the go-to method used to identify extreme control groups and cults and the methods that they use to coerce, recruit, and maintain control of their members. Before we get started, please give the video a thumbs up. That helps this information get out to more people. This weekend at a Kingdom Hall near you, Jehovah's Witnesses will be covering article number 6 from the February 2024 Watchtower Study Edition. The article is entitled, Praise the Name of Jehovah. Paragraph 2 says, All the problems we see in the world, the deaths, the wars, the misery, have come about because of the lies that Satan began to spread in the Garden of Eden. Does Jehovah feel pain because of such slander and its results? This is an example of thought control. Require members to internalize the group's doctrine as truth, adopting the group's map of reality as reality, instill black and white thinking, decide between good versus evil, organize people into us versus them, insiders versus outsiders. This is the jumping off point. If you don't accept that all of life's and humankind's problems are due to the event that happened in the Garden of Eden, then the rest of the article is a mute point, null and void. You have to accept their version of the Garden of Eden and their reasoning. You have to accept their version of reality that this all came about because Satan told Eve to eat the fruit and questioned Jehovah's sovereignty, as seen in this cartoon for child indoctrination. From the beginning, Jehovah has always cared about people. Sadly, many of them have caused him great pain. There have been lots of things wrong with the world for thousands of years. Jehovah wants to fix them all. But he's waiting for just the right time to do it. One small, slanderous lie in Eden is the reason for all human suffering. Let the punishment fit the crime, am I right? On to our first subheading. We please Jehovah when we praise his name. Speaks of God being the best daddy in the whole wide universe. It claims that God doesn't command praise because he's insecure. No. It then gives an illustration and corresponding image of a father whose daughter spontaneously expresses love to him. This is not the same thing. Unless we skipped the part where this father said, I command you to love me, and if you don't love me, and you disobey me, I will kill you like I do all of my enemies. If, if he did say that, then yeah, yeah, they're the same. This is a false equivalency. This is also an attempt to infantilize Jehovah's Witnesses. This is the second article in a row where they're being compared to a child-parent relationship. This is a form of thought control. Techniques are used to undermine critical thinking and even to age regress the member. Paragraph 5 lets you know that you have some skin in the game, and it says that Satan's lie includes you and your integrity, and that each of us has the privilege of loyally standing up for our Father's name and of pleasing Him by serving Him with integrity. It is truly an honor to do so. It's a privilege and an honor. This is emotional control. Manipulate and narrow the range of feelings. Some emotions and or needs are deemed as evil, wrong, or selfish. You should feel honored. You should feel this is a privilege. It then mentions Job and that his loyalty was tested. Jehovah allowed him to be tormented because of a bet that took place in heaven between him and Satan. And Job lost all his livestock. All his children suddenly died. He was inflicted with painful leprosy. And it says he proved himself loyal. So you really have no excuse to not view your loyalty as an honor and a privilege. Because paragraph 6 says love for God moves faithful people to praise his name wholeheartedly. If you're not doing so wholeheartedly, if you're not seeing it as an honor and a privilege, you're not a faithful person. This is an example of emotional control. Promote feelings of guilt or unworthiness, 
such as identity guilt, you are not living up to your potential, your family is deficient, your past is suspect, your affiliations are unwise, your thoughts, feelings, actions are irrelevant or selfish, social guilt. The congregation will then be instructed to read Nehemiah 9.5, and we won't because, I'm sorry, it's boring and barely relevant. Paragraph 7. We stand out in this wicked world. According to Jehovah's Witnesses, the entire world is lying in the power of the wicked one, aka Satan, aka the devil. The whole world is under his influence. All the religious leaders that aren't theirs, all the governments, all your doctors, the media, your kids' teachers, your boss and co-workers, any of them unwittingly at any moment could be used by Satan to pull a Jehovah's Witness away from this organization. And the May 2014 Watchtower, the section Bible Questions Answered, says this. Many people believe that the true God is the ruler of this world. But if that were true, would the earth be so filled with suffering? According to the Bible, the world is under the control of someone evil. 1 John 5.19 reads, We know that we originate with God, but the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. This is a form of emotional control. Instill fear, such as fear of thinking independently, the outside world, enemies, losing one's salvation, leaving or being shunned by the group, others' disapproval. And just the term, the wicked world, is a use of buzzwords or loaded language. This is a form of thought control. Use of loaded language and cliches which constrict knowledge, stop critical thoughts, and reduce complexities into platitudinous buzzwords. Next subheading. We please Jesus when we praise Jehovah's name. Surprisingly, paragraphs 8 through 13, I didn't catch any bite model. It's also a section I probably would have enjoyed as a believing Jehovah's Witness because the paragraphs all mention Jesus, who, for a religion that claims to be Christian, doesn't get mentioned as often as he should. I would, however, like to speak about paragraph 9. It's talking about how Jesus helped people understand his father Jehovah God more clearly than ever before. It reads, Jesus made that truth clearer than ever when he related the parable of the wayward son and his father. That father catching sight of his repentant son while he was still a long way off, running to meet him, embracing him, and forgiving him wholeheartedly. We see a most vivid picture of Jehovah's mercy and compassion. This is the well-known parable of the prodigal son, and the image is of a father embracing their wayward child. This is what Jesus gave and it, as an example of God's love. So why then do the governing body claim that shunning is a form of God's love? They loved me and wanted me to come back to Jehovah. I tried to contact them. I just wanted to talk and to hear their voice. I missed being with my family. And they thought about reaching out to me. But they knew that if they had associated with me, even a little, just to check on me, that small dose of association might have satisfied me. I kept wondering how he was doing. Was he okay? That night, after the meeting, I told Ben about the text I received from Levi. How I miss Levi so much, but that I also wanted to be loyal to Jehovah. Ben admitted that he too had been struggling with feelings like mine. But then, he said something that I hadn't thought of. If we were to stand between Levi and the discipline he needs, we would in effect be blocking an expression of Jehovah's love from reaching him. A Jehovah's Witness will probably argue that the son in these verses, in this parable, 
was repentant and quote unquote returned to Jehovah. But I'm going to push back on that because if you actually read the scriptures, it doesn't say that. Uh, the son squandered his money and returned home broke. He said, I'm sorry I sinned. And his dad took him in and celebrated. He didn't actually know what went on. There was no cell phones or Instagram updates or anything for him to even know what his son was saying sorry for. It, it, he didn't tell him, oh, well, you're actually going to have to wait a 6 to 12 month probationary period of complete social isolation before we will actually speak to you or consider accepting you back into the family. The father didn't even chastise him for the decisions he made, which left him broke. He just accepted him. He showed him compassion and love with no conditions. So just think about that while you're shunning your friends and family. This won't count towards the final score, but shunning is an example of behavior control. Dictate where, how, and with whom the member lives and associates or isolates. Information control. Minimize or discourage access to non-cult sources of information, including former members. Keep members busy so they don't have time to think and investigate. Emotional control. Phobia indoctrination. Inculcating irrational fears about leaving the group or questioning the leader's authority. No happiness or fulfillment possible outside the group. Terrible consequences if you leave. Shunning of those who leave. Fear of being rejected by friends and family. Never a legitimate reason to leave. Those who leave are weak, undisciplined, unspiritual, worldly, brainwashed by family or counselor, or seduced by money, sex, or rock and roll. Also in paragraph 9, the very first sentence says, Jesus did more than just inform people that God's name is Jehovah. It's not. It, it isn't that. This here is the Tetragrammaton. This is a Tetragrammaton that Jehovah's Witness children can color if you print it off their website. This is the original Hebrew writing, and it translates to YHWH in the New World Translation, the Jehovah's Witness Bible. In the very back, there's an appendix. Under appendix number four, A4, it talks about a Bible scholar, Joseph Bryant Rotherham. He was an Englishman from the UK, and a book was published in his name after he died in 1910, and the book published in 1911 explains that he used the name Jehovah instead of Yahweh because it was a form of the name more familiar to the general Bible reading public. So what this means is the name Jehovah was easier for English speakers to say. The name Jehovah is the equivalent of woman at the nail salon telling you her name is Lisa because it's an English name you won't be too lazy to try and pronounce. Jehovah is a nickname, basically. This information is right there in the back of the Jehovah's Witness Bible, fully admitting that it really isn't even close to the original name. This is an example of information control. Deception. Deliberately withhold information distort information to make it more acceptable, systematically lie to the cult member. All this work, all this time and emphasis on sanctifying and praising God's name, and you're not even pronouncing it correctly. Imagine someone were giving you a job reference or referral, or you're in court and somebody is giving you a character witness, and Every time they say your name, they say it wrong or they spell it incorrectly. How annoying would that be? How annoying is it when somebody can't get your name right or purposely calls you something other than your name because they can't be bothered to learn how to say it correctly? Final subheading, we help to save lives when we praise Jehovah's name. Yikes, no pressure. 
How are you saving lives by speaking about Jehovah? It says, Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. They have come to believe such satanic lies as God does not exist. God is remote and does not care about mankind. God is cruel and tortures wrongdoers forever. We teach people the truth. Most Christian religions believe in a hellfire. They believe that if you sin and do wrong, uh, that you would go to hell and pay for your sins. In this paragraph here, they say that that is a satanic lie, that God is cruel and tortures wrongdoers forever in a hellfire. So basically, every other Christian religion that believes in this is believing in satanic lies. This is an example of thought control. Labeling alternative belief systems as illegitimate, evil, or not useful. Thought control. Require members to internalize the group's doctrine as truth, adopting the group's map of reality as reality. Instill black and white thinking. Decide between good versus evil. Organize people into us versus them. Insiders versus outsiders. You, as a believing Jehovah's Witness, you're on the inside. You're an insider. You have life-saving information that you need to impart to others. Also, calling their religion the truth is another form of a use of buzzwords. The entire rest of the article is meant to hype Jehovah's Witness up for the ministry, and specifically for sharing God's name, or what they profess to be God's name, and his attributes. They mention some possibly real, potentially made-up people's experience when hearing the name Jehovah for the first time and how it changed their lives. I only want to focus on Steve. It does say some names have been changed. Steve was raised Jewish, and the paragraph says he distanced himself from organized religion because he had seen so much hypocrisy. However, during a time of grief, he agreed to sit in on a Bible study conducted by one of Jehovah's Witnesses. This is a predatory thing that all Jehovah's Witnesses are unwittingly trained to do, to pounce when someone is emotionally vulnerable, when their circumstances have changed. When I was a fully believing Jehovah's Witness, I didn't know what I was doing was love bombing. I didn't know the tactics that we used in the ministry were predatory and manipulative. I believed, like this article said, that I was helping people. They coerced maybe Steve and manipulated him while he was emotionally vulnerable. This is a clip from cult expert Rick Allen Ross, founder of Cult Education Institute. Full link, it will be in the description below. If there is one uh, situation or characteristic that I see that is a common element regarding many people that have been recruited and tricked by destructive cults, it would be this, that at that particular point in their life, they were going through a difficult time. Uh, they were going through a divorce. They were unemployed. They were physically ill. Uh, someone had died that they loved. They were at a vulnerable point in their life. And at that juncture, they had the bad luck that someone uh, fairly persuasive, or more likely someone they knew and they trusted, came along and said, I have a group that can help you. I have a way to heal you, to make the hurt better. Come with me to this group. Come with me to the weekend seminar. Come with me and you will uh, benefit from this. And uh, the person who was asking them to join, was the, was, that person was a true believer. So it was a sincere effort on that person's part. This is a common tactic. And why does it work? Well, another cult expert, Yanya Lilik, says this. Please note the voiceover is done by a man, even though she is a woman. A typical cult requires a high level of commitment from its members and maintains a strict hierarchy, separating unsuspecting supporters and recruits from the inner workings. It claims to provide answers to life's biggest questions through its doctrine. Cults are skilled at knowing whom to target, often focusing on those new to an area or who have recently undergone some personal or professional loss. 
loneliness and a desire for meaning make one susceptible to friendly people offering community. When you're emotionally vulnerable, feeling lost, or in a state of transition, having all the answers in a seemingly eager support group seems positive. Paragraph 17 ends by telling Jehovah's Witnesses to continue preaching because they're saving lives and pleasing God. They ingrain this into you so that you really feel all the time that you spend volunteer recruiting for them is important. It's life-saving work. This is an example of behavior control. Major time spent with group indoctrination and rituals and or self-indoctrination, including the internet. When I woke up from my indoctrination before my official dissociation, I went and donated blood, something you're not allowed to do as a Jehovah's Witness. And ironically, after being an auxiliary pioneer for years, sitting in that blood drive chair was the first time I could say, I maybe helped save a life. The Watchtower Bible Tract Society lied to me, and they're lying to you and many people who in their spirits want to help, want the world to be a better place. But instead, eight million or so are stuck in a dangerous cult that exploits them and protects abusers and criminals. On that cheery note, that brings us to an end <laughs> of this week's article. Let's tally up the score. We have one for behavior control, one for information control, five for thought control, and three for emotional control. That gives us a grand total of 1,153, a number just as accurate as the common acceptable use of the nickname Jehovah. Thank you so much for joining me again this week. If you found any of the information helpful, please leave a comment. I enjoy hearing from you and I really do my best to reply. Please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Continue thinking freely, black sheep. Keep an eye out for my new short series, Media Mondays. See you next week.